Hi everyone, it's Mr. H here. Today we're going to look at a really good example of how to interpret sinusoidal functions. And we're just going to quickly review what sine of x and cos of x both look like. So our goals are the following. We want to graph sine of x, cos of x. You want to get very comfortable with what those look like. Be able to identify the five key points and draw the curve through them. We want to determine the key properties of periodic functions arising from real, real world applications and interpret what they mean in different settings. And lastly, we want to determine the future behavior of graphs. So we want to be able to predict what's going to happen in the future, not on the graph. So let's go ahead and graph sine of x and cos of x. This is your y-axis. This is your x-axis, where x is an angle in degrees. So sine of x, if you remember, is all about the height of Freddy the Frog on his mill wheel uh, as he's spinning around over time. And so he's starting at a height of 0. And then after 90 degrees, he's at a height of 1. After 180 degrees, he's back to zero. Uh, then if we keep going, I've got a dot there that I shouldn't have. Uh, if we keep going to 270, we're at negative one. If I go to 360, I'm back at zero. 90 more is um, 450. Now we're back at positive one. And then at 530, we're back at zero. And so it's going to look something like this. Right? It's important, you're not necessarily going to draw it perfectly, but it's important you draw it as a curve and not straight lines between those. Because it's, it's staying close to that maximum when it's near the max, and it's staying close to that minimum when it's near the min for a while. But as it's going about the equation of the axis, uh, or the x-axis, it's, uh, it's actually pretty steep at that point. So let's go ahead and let's graph cos of x. That was y equals sine of x. Let's go ahead and graph cos of x. And that one is starting at 1. And again, every 90 degrees, we're changing um, by 1. So from 1 down to 0, 90 degrees more, we're down to negative 1. And notice I'm just lining these above or below the points I already had for the sine function, but just making them 90 degrees off. Because as you recall, this... Um, the, uh, the cosine function and sine function are 90 degrees off from each other. So this is the cosine function there. Looks something, whoops, more curved there. Looks something like that. So this is y equals cos of x. And so literally, if you take the sine function, you shift it 90 degrees to the left, you get the cosine function. If you take the cosine function, you shift it 90 degrees to the right, you get the sine function. And so that's really all you have to do. They're the same thing, just one is shifted 90 degrees to the other. The next lesson that I teach is going to show us how we can actually uh, do that shifting so that we can represent, for example, the blue line both as y equals sine x and as something in terms of cosine as well. So how are these similar? How are they different? Well, the main way that they are similar is they are the same shape. Not only are they the same shape, they are the same period. Not only are they the same period, they're also the, uh, the same amplitude. The only thing that makes them, we could say it's the same um, axis as well. The only thing that makes them different is the, uh, is the phase shift. So sine and cosine are phase shifted 90 degrees from one another. Okay, so there we go. That's the graphs. Let's move on to an example of what this is like now. This example says two students are riding their bikes. A pebble is stuck in the tire of each bike. The two graphs show the heights of the pebbles above the ground in terms of time. Now, if you have uh, a PDF of this, it might not be colored. So hopefully now that you see the color, it helps you to see it a little bit better. You can see that bike B is this curve right here. Right there, that one. And you can see that bike A is the taller one, the one with the larger amplitude and the one that goes up higher. And so, as you'll notice, the period of bike A is actually larger, because it's almost, or it's exactly 0.6 seconds, it's larger than the period of bike B, that's 0.5 seconds. Right, and that make, might make you to assume uh, maybe they're not traveling the same speed, all this kind of thing. But let's actually analyze this and see what's really happening. The first question to ask here is what's the axle height for the wheel on bike A and bike B? So bike A, the axle height would be smack in the middle of the wheel. If the wheel goes up to 60 centimeters 
and then down to zero, the axle height better be in the middle of the wheel or we don't have a functioning wheel. Um, so the axle height for that first bike A would be 30 centimeters. I'm just going to write that right there. That's 30 centimeters. Bike B, because that wheel is going from zero to 50, the axle height there has to be halfway in between. That would be 25 centimeters. Then it asks, what's the wheel diameter and radius for bike A and bike B? Well, hopefully you can see that it follows from what we just found. The amplitude of this wave is the diameter of the wheel, or the radius, rather, of the wheel. So the amplitude, I'm just going to write this the same, the amplitude equals the radius of the wheel. So in the case of bike A, you can see that it's going from 30 up to 60. Uh, or you can think about it in terms of the fact that it's a 60 centimeter diameter and the radius is half of that. So in bike A, it's a 30 centimeter, uh, sorry, 60 centimeter diameter. It's a 30 centimeter radius because it's asking for the diameter and the radius. And for bike B, the diameter for that one is going to be 50 centimeters with a radius of 25 centimeters. The qu next question says, how long does it take each wheel to complete one revolution? And this is where we have to do a little bit of a uh, little bit more thinking. We have to analyze the graph now on the x-axis. And so how long it takes, well, we noted for bike A, it's the black line, going from zero all the way to 0.6 seconds, that's one full cycle. So for bike A, it's 0.6 seconds. All right, one full cycle is how long it takes to complete one revolution. For bike B, we noticed that that was from 0 to 0.5. So that's 0 0.5 seconds. And so now we actually have to do some calculations with these numbers. It says now, how fast is each bicycle traveling? Well, if we know the radius and we know the time, we can calculate the speed. Let me first remind you that speed is equal to distance over time. Because some people just get immediately intimidated by that question. Like, where is it even coming from? We're going to do a lot with this unit about speed. And speed is always going to be distance over time. If we're talking about a circle, a wheel, going all the way around a wheel, the distance around that wheel is the circumference. And if we're going around the circumference once, it's the time for one cycle. So we're getting somewhere now, I hope you can see. What's the circumference? Well, the circumference of any wheel is pi d or 2 pi r. You could say, or pi d. And so the time for one cycle is um, depending on the period. That is what that is actually asking. So what we can do here is we can say for bike A, the speed is equal to 2 pi r divided by the period, as it is for bike B. And so we know the radius is going to be, for bike A, 30 centimeters. And we know the period is 0 0.6 seconds. Then we go 2 times pi times 30 divided by 0.6. Now notice that this is going to give us units of centimeters per second, which we'll have to deal with in a minute with part E when it asks for kilometers. But for now, we can go with centimeters per second. What we get is for bike A is a value of 188.50 centimeters divided by those 0.6 seconds, or a value of 314.2 centimeters per second. For bike B, we're going to do the same thing. The speed is going to be equal to 2 times pi times the radius there was 25 centimeters. And we're dividing this by 0.5 seconds. And what we get here is 157.08 centimeters divided by those 0.5 seconds. And we get 314.2 centimeters per second. Those two bikes are actually moving at the same speed. Really cool. Who would have thought? All right, let's look at this last question now. It says, how high will the pebble be off the ground after it's traveled 0.1 kilometers? And I'm going to make a short video going over that as a separate video. So you can check that out next.